too many microphones perhaps to juggle. Thank you, Marcel. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, good evening. My name's Bronwyn Regan. I'm uh, Chief of Staff to Zali Stegel, the Federal Member for Warringah. And I'd like to thank you all for coming out this evening uh, to join us for a community forum. So over the last three years, we've regularly been having our community forums, um, albeit some of them had to shift to being online, but we've really enjoyed this um, as a team to, to come out into the community uh, to tell you what we've been doing both in Canberra and more locally, but also to hear from you and, and to take questions from you about the issues um, of concern. So over the three years, it's been a real highlight for us as a team to do it quite regularly. Uh, this is our second time back here at North Curl Curl Surf Life Saving Club. So it's nice to be back um, up here on the beach. Apologies for the weather. I know it's beyond our control, but um, thank you for persevering and coming out this evening. So I'd like to um, acknowledge country and in acknowledging country and elders past, present and emergency em emerging, we do uh, acknowledge that the sorrow that has been brought um, through that dispossession and uh, Zali will speak a little bit more to that shortly, but um, it is important for us as a team to acknowledge that past possession. So like to thank you all again for, for coming and uh, joining Zali this evening. We hope you've got some questions for her. She's going to provide a bit of an update, um, but we have made sure that we've left lots of times for our questions and answers. Um, we do believe that meeting with your community and being available to your community is a really important part of being a member of parliament or even running for parliament. So being available is, is something that is always very important to Zali. And certainly at the office, we have an open door policy an open lift policy actually. Anyone that's been to our office in Manly, you know there's a clunky old lift that used to be locked at the bottom. Um, it hasn't been locked for three years, so um, we're quite proud of having an open door policy there. But anyway, a bit of housekeeping. Um, for those of you joining us on Facebook this evening, thank you very much. It's great to uh, have you all online. Um, please feel free to contribute with some questions later on in the, uh, the proceedings. Um, we'll make sure that uh, your questions get some answers as well. So thank you very much for joining us. You're uh, probably a bit drier and a bit warmer than we are uh, here tonight, but uh, good on you. And to those of you in the room, again, just um, any questions that you might have during Zali's presentation, um, feel free just to hold on to them until the end of the evening. But it is now my pleasure, um, absolute pleasure, to uh, hand over to the member for Warringah, Zali Stegel. Uh, and thank you everyone for being here tonight. I know it's not the most uh, uh, sort of friendly night with the weather, but it is important to be out um, and incredibly important for me to hear from you. Uh, and thank you also to my team that's here to make this possible um, and to be here to available for your questions if there's anything more specific from a policy point of view or a query that we can assist with. Um, I would also like to pay my respects to Indigenous elders past, present and emerging and acknowledge their custodianship for the land on which we meet. Incredibly, uh, the world's longest living culture at 65,000 years uh, with an incredible record of taking care of this land, the sea and the air and some much that we can learn from. Uh, and it is sad to acknowledge that in this last parliament we have not progressed the Uluru Statement of the Heart and uh, constitutional recognition. Uh, I should say I have met with Minister Wyatt about it and encouraged him and urged him to bring that before the parliament. Uh, I think the internal uh, dis I guess uh, there was disunity on the issue and opposition to it meant that he did not feel that he could progress it despite the assurances at the last election. Uh, and they, the, the government pursued a, a, a model of uh, a rec uh, sort of a, a voice to parliament as opposed to or a voice to government uh, and it simply is not the model that's recommended. So I strongly support the Uluru Statement from the Heart and will press in this next parliament for a motion to be moved so that uh, a referendum can be um can be called uh, and that recognition to happen. But so if I could start with um, a little bit of an update in terms of the last three years in Parliament, it has been incredibly busy. It's incredible to think that we're now coming around again for this uh, 2022 election. I promise to be a leader on climate change and to bring forward solutions that bring people to the table. 
end the divisive politics. So it was incredibly important for me to bring forward the climate change bill. It had the support of over 110 organisations. It had the support, and for the first time, really, we brought together business, industry, unions, conservation groups, environmental groups, and civic society united towards this call for a framework and for good legislation. The government still opposed to that level of commitment and that level of accountability by locking in good processes around our emissions reduction, um, but it's very much uh, on my agenda and policy that I'll talk a little bit more about, about the focus for this coming uh, parliament. Other areas where we were incredibly successful in protecting our local environment was actually around PEP 11, so the Petroleum Exploration Licence uh, in an area from Newcastle to Manly, and it was with the amazing support of the community that we were able uh, to pressure the government into uh, uh, putting an end to that project uh, and dismissing the application for the project to be extended and expanded. And, and that is really a, such a, uh, an achievement of our local community in really supporting the actions that I was able to take in Canberra by putting forward legislation. Uh, I moved amendments to the NAIF bill, which is a Northern uh, Australia Infrastructure Funding, uh, the EFIC, which is uh, Export Finance Funding, uh, the EPBC, the Environmental Protection, Biodiversity and Conservation Bill, uh, which you may all have participated in the Samuel Review, um, with an overwhelming amount of recommendations in relation to our poor legislation and poor record of biodiversity and conservation, a uh, huge loss of of flora and fauna um, in Australia. We have a, a terrible record, actually, of loss of native animal and native species. Um, but yet the government really opposed uh, and failed to bring forward the full recommendations of the Samuels Review. We tried, uh, again, we're only a couple of votes short in Parliament for being able to pass those amendments. Uh, important locally was also around supporting the Sydney Harbour Federation Trust. Uh, you may, may have participated in the review uh, in relation to the function of the truck and the trust and the management of the lands. And here in Warringah, incredibly important, we have quite a substantial amount of trust uh, properties uh, when it comes to North Head, uh, te uh, 10 Terminal uh, and, and a number of others. They are all uh, facing, they desperately need rehabilitation and conservation and there still hasn't been substantial enough funding put towards that. Uh, I was, it was an honour to start Parliamentary Friends of Climate Action with uh, colleagues on the crossbench, with Helen Haynes, the member for Indi, and Rebecca Sharkey. Um, and we were able to have several uh, events where we could really raise and bring together people, you know, pa parliamentary colleagues from both sides of politics to come together to hear from experts and look at solutions. Um, also instigated a review of the UNGI program um, with the Auditor General. Now, integrity has played a big part of the discussion around politics so far. And uh, at the moment, without a Federal Integrity Commission, the only checks and balances or process we have is the Auditor General. Sadly, the Auditor General can only really come after the fact when a uh, program is referred to the Auditor General for uh, investigation. Uh, the Auditor General did accept the UNGI. It's run out of time now, but it continues to be on the program in relation to needing to be investigated. On integrity, well, I've seconded the Integrity Commission Bill and remain incredibly committed to that. Um, and also introduced Truth in Political Advertising Bill. It was quite an eye-opener for me at the last election to discover there is no rules, no laws around truth in political advertising. What, especially in circumstances where in the normal world, <laughs> the real world outside of politics and the bubble of politics, um, businesses, commerce, production of services, everyone is bound by rules and laws. It is crazy that the political uh, arena is held to a much different standard. Uh, yes, and, and it really is uh, wrong. I think it, it, and it erodes trust in democracy and government when you don't have uh, a level of truth in that kind of advertising. From an inclusion point of view, it has been a really exciting time. Uh, for the first time, Warringah uh, sponsored and hosted a float in the Mardi Gras, and it was a real privilege to have the Independence for Inclusion float, uh, where I invited uh, some of our neighbours and some of our, in our community, um, members of the LGBTQI 
DIY community to participate and they had ownership and, and really um, the drive of that project. Um, and it was a really uh, positive uh, experience. It was incredibly joyful. Uh, and it was great that I was able to host uh, Dr. Sophie Scomps, uh, Kylie Tinks and, um, uh, and Allegra Spender as our sort of neighbouring um, electorates. Um, I think from a, from a caring point of view though, we were able to help over 300 people home or with travel exemptions. It was an incredibly challenging time the last three years, especially the last two with COVID and lockdowns. And Julie in fact is here who was an amazing person in the office who took calls and assisted so many people in our community that needed assistance. And I get stopped regularly on the street and at bus stops even just this morning uh, by, a by a constituent saying thank you for the assistance they received. Uh, in doing that. And sometimes in politics, you know, it's, it's hard to really quantify outcomes or really feel how much you can make a difference. But there was an opportunity uh, when Kabul fell to the Taliban and uh, the Corps came to help some Afghan refugees. Uh, the, with the members in my team at the office, but in particular Luke, who is in the back here, worked around the clock to help as many as we could that reached out for help. And we're able to help over 100 Afghan refugees reach Australia. And that was quite incredible because obviously sometimes uh, it can be overwhelming, the plight of so many people in need of help. But when you know you can actually, in real terms, change um, some people's lives, it was uh, incredibly fulfilling. So I think that really is a reflection on Warringah to have been able to achieve that. So thank you from, for the community uh, to have you know, enabled that to happen. We have had uh, some 19,500 community cases. Uh, we've had a, just a huge amount of emails to the office and correspondence. I feel like the number one role as a member of parliament is actually your, as your representatives and we are here to serve the community. And so that has been absolutely our focus. Uh, and with that, it has been receiving so many emails and queries and, and requests for help. Um, and that's why we call them community cases in terms of how can we help and what we need to do. And I've had an incredibly hard working team, mainly locals, we stretch the boundaries of Warringah a little bit occasionally, but mostly, and, and a team of volunteers who have dedicated for the last three years so many hours weekly to help serve the community. And that's an incredible, um, I think, testimony to how um, invested the community is to, I think, an independent Warringah and a different type of representation. The last two years have been quite um, marked in Parliament in terms of culture and integrity. Uh, I don't think anyone can get through 2021 without thinking of Grace Tame being Australian of the Year, uh, the allegations from Brittany Higgins of the culture in Parliament. Um, that led to me moving the amendment to the Sex Discrimination Act, which ultimately pressured the government in implementing some of the recommendations of the Respect at Work report. There are still some recommendations to go and I'm committed to making sure the rest is implemented. It's incredibly important that we do that. Uh, from, an from the economy point of view, it was incredibly challenging. And that's where I have to thank all chambers of commerce that we have locally for their incredible commitment to our local businesses. We had a number of forums and a number of engagements where I heard directly from businesses with state members. We both, uh, state members uh, obviously advocating to state government, me advocating to federal government, really pushed the case of how was assistance working was it or not? Was it tailored enough? Did it need more flexibility? And pushing for specific uh, outcomes. Um, it was incredibly important to make sure business was heard through an incredibly challenging time. Now, a question about being independent is always, well, what can you deliver? And can we really bring about, you know, real outcomes? And people tend to think of that in dollar terms. Uh, one of my first focus in uh, establishing the office was to have a grants uh, officer. And that means someone who can assist and work with our local organisations to make sure they can apply for grants, understand what grants may be available. And not just federal grants. We're talking about local, state, federal, private grants as well. Um, but also ensure that there was due process, an arm's length process. So I established a grants committee that was char that, that um, we um, 
uh, had to disclose any conflicts of interest or any relationships and ensure that we had a really truly fair process, democratic process around grants, uh, recipients and applications in the, the electorate. And it shows, the outcome, the results show that that is the model that works. We've had over 131 million in grants uh, to the community in Warringah over the last three years. It's very hard to compare it to previous periods because the government changed the way they calculate it, but it's a significant increase compared to the, under the previous member. So that certainly answers the, uh, the, you know, the question of, uh, do you miss out on anything by not being with a major party? And I can assure you um, the area does not. Um, in terms of healthcare, we had uh, the outcome, of course, of the Royal Commission into Aged Care, um, and uh, there was a review in relation to NDIS and independent assessments. We hosted a forum online to be able to hear from members in the community that were engaging with that process, um, and it was incredibly important. And it is with that sustained feedback that, in fact, the government abandoned uh, the proposed independent assessments, which were uh, roundly opposed by so many in the community. If I could say more specifically, to give you a bit of an update on this area more particularly, so the top constituent issues for the beaches, so I think in Curl Curl DY, Brookvale and Freshwater, um, in terms of emails received by the office, it was Afghanistan exit, uh, the coronavirus vaccine, clearly not a surprise. Um, the Biloela family, which of course we should remember there was a family that were uh, moved uh, by uh, shortly after the last election and have remained in detention ever since for the last three years. And obviously their fate probably heavily depends on the outcome of this election again. Uh, aged care and the outcome of the Royal Commission and obviously the implementation of the recommendations, travel restrictions uh, and, uh, and issues around domestic vaccine passports and really the breakdown, I think, of Australia as one nation. <laughs> and I say one nation, not as one nation, but as a whole nation, uh, rather than thinking of us all as so many separate states. Um, it was really challenging, I think, to see us really break down into a very parochial state-by-state -state kind of battles. Um, and I think it did erode a little bit of that Australian spirit. And I think it is time for a bit more um, building and bringing us all back together in a more unified way. Um, we obviously, as I said, a lot of emails around federal ICAC, uh, and I'm incredibly committed to that. It, I'm often asked, is, has becoming a politician been what I thought it would be? And I, I have to say that my best expectations have been met and my worst expectations have been met. Uh, the best is when you can genuinely help people, when we have been able to resolve cases, whether it be NDIS or aged care or refugees, um, generally you know, uh, make a difference in someone's lives in a real way. Um, unfortunately, the worst of my expectations being the culture of Canberra and maybe the lack of fiscal discipline um, and some of that as well um, has been met as well. I have been quite shocked by the lack of due diligence that I've observed with government, especially with spending of millions and often billions of public public taxpayer funds. I think there's a, recently a report came out suggesting some $55 billion worth of public funds over the last four years have essentially been rorted through grants programs of various sorts. No. It is a huge amount of money when you think about it. So when we talk about being at a level of record debt, where we need fiscal discipline, where all of you as citizens have had to be very disciplined. You know, we've hit tough times, businesses have been shut. Um, to then see the largesse that I observe in the granting of certain programs, I find it quite sickening. Um, especially when I then have arguments, you know, I met with, for example, uh, Minister Rustin uh, around uh, the basic job seeker rate, or what was known at the last election as New Start, and we're debating over a rise of $2.50 a week uh, for um, uh, people uh, you know, needing assistance. So $2.50 a day, maybe it was, I can't, I can't remember. I'll, I'll be caught on my figure. Um, but, uh, but it was such a minor adjustment. It was, really was such a tokenistic increase compared to then the millions that I see wasted uh, without accountability or proper return to the public. And I find that quite, um, quite sickening. 
Uh, in terms of here locally, so if I think of uh, north of Spit uh, as the section of the electorate, um, we've had uh, some 208 grants, so nearly two thirds of the grants to Warringah have come to this part of the electorate, um, a total of some 92 million. Uh, two main recipients were Cerebral Palsy Alliance and Royal Far West, uh, but there was also an incredibly good spread across businesses, health, community services and sports and recreation. Uh, and in fact, here at North Curl Curl Surf Club, there was a powering community grants in 2021 of some $8,000 to upgrade to LED lighting, which we're all enjoying. Um, some of our other community grant recipients were South Curl Curl Surf Life Saving Club, Queenscliff Surf Life Saving Club, North Stain Surf Life Saving Club, Lifeline Northern Beaches, Vinnie's, Childhood Dementia Initiative, Raiders Rugby, Friends of Freshwater, Friends of Ivanhoe Park, Bargala Bowling Club, Seaforth Bowling Club, Manly Warringah Pipe Band, Manly Bombers AFL, Scouts, various groups, um, Northern Beaches Women's Shelter and Forestville RSL, Community Care Northern Beaches, Men's Kitchen Association, Northern Beaches Volleyball Association, Manly Warringah Football Association and Warringah Bowling Club. So it's been really good to diversify the amount of organisations that we've been able to assist um, and make sure they have a fair access to all of that. Uh, I've been incredibly proud of our area in terms of our compliance. We've had several lockdowns, we've had incredibly tough times, oh, yeah. but also our um, our vaccination race has, has been incredibly well. Um, shame. Well, that's a good part. I wouldn't say shame on that. Mossman, oh, yeah. uh, we've had 92% oh, yeah. two doses, 77% booster. North Sydney, two doses at 85%. Northern Beaches, we have over 95% at two doses, but still 67% at booster. So as we approach winter, it is a reminder that it's a good idea to get that additional uh, shot Hell to no. make sure. Well, probably disagree. Anyway, the we need we businesses need to be operating, so we do need to or take all the precautions necessary. Um, the Billawila family is still living in Perth in community detention, and so there is a lot of focus on that leading into uh, this election. Uh, in terms of transport, unfortunately, not hasn't progressed well. The Beaches Link uh, Tunnel, we had the EIS, Environmental Impact Statement, we had a review. Um, there are some environmental concerns that need addressing, but in light of the, um, well, you know, horrendous um, uh, disasters we've had between floods and bushfires, the, the New South Wales State Government has put on hold the, the next part of um, that process. Um, but it remains an issue, as we all experience um, the disruption of flooding. Uh, we know transport and upgrade of infrastructure is incredibly important and that needs to continue to be progressed. Um, in terms of other local issues to update you on, um, I think it's incredibly important that we not underestimate that our community has a number of issues when it came to domestic violence and housing and homelessness. I know housing affordability is a, is a major issue, but in particular in terms of homelessness that older women over 55 are the fastest group experiencing homelessness. It's quite shocking that a modern nation like Australia is facing those statistics and we absolutely must do more. And I have got some policy proposals that I'm happy to go through in more detail. Um, in terms of aged care, uh, it was, I've visited a number of institutions locally um, and uh, written to the Minister and requested a number of times that we urgently uh, implement the recommendations. Um, and I've worked with fellow crossbenchers, Rebecca Sharkey, a lot in that respect. Uh, in terms of uh, other issues that have been raised with, with the office. Um, it has been very focused on obviously COVID over the last uh, two, well, year and a half, two years. And, um, and, uh, and in relation to some of the measures taken when it came to parental reunification for families. And so we has, ha had to help a lot of people. Uh, an issue that always, uh, Warringah is a very caring community um, and live export, animal exports, whilst we're not a farming community here, there is a high level of care. Uh, and so I seconded Andrew Wilkie's bill in relation to stopping live exports, but that is still uh, something the government resists. Ooh. So, what can we do for the next three years? There's, um, there is so much more. Um, 
We need to pass the Federal Integrity Commission. We need yeah. to pass the Climate Change Bill. We need to pass the, the um, Stopping Lying and Political Advertising. We need to raise the bar from an integrity point of view and a long-term policy point of view. So I've got some details here for anyone who would like to read more from a policy point of view around the providing more climate leadership um, and having a clear plan of what we need to achieve. We know global warming is impacting our lives now. So a lot of discussion at this election on cost of living. Let's be really clear. Global warming directly impacts cost of living. Your food prices, your fuel prices, your insurance prices, all of these are directly impacted by events. When you have, for example, events like the, um, the floods in Lismore and Ballina, they have completely disrupted uh, supply lanes, lines. They have shut down businesses, shut down whole communities. If we don't address global warming, we will not be able to rein in cost of living. And that is from economists around the nation that are calling on that. Sadly, at the last budget, we didn't see any urgency from the government in this respect. We still see an overwhelming funding of fossil fuels over renewable or a transition to clean energy. We actually calculated it's some $22,000 per minute being provided to fossil fuels uh, by way of subsidies, which is quite a shocking balance, really, in terms of where we go. And to put it in perspective, over the last three years, disasters, so floods and fires, have cost some $10.3 billion to our budget. And that's without putting a price, which is immeasurable, from an, uh, an emotional and a well-being on our communities. So we have to be very clear that these are direct impacts. You cannot separate out economic management with climate management. These are interlinked. You cannot have one without the other. Um, and we are being warned. The IPCC report that came out only a couple of weeks ago, which the government and the opposition have yet failed to properly respond to, make clear there is a very dire warning. We are going to see increasing frequency and increasing severity of events that will compound with one another to a point where governments of all level, be local government, state government or federal government, will not be able to cope, will not be able to respond, and communities will be left exposed. We've seen that with the floods in Lismore. We saw that with bushfires. We simply can't allow that to get any worse. The good news, we have all the technology, we have the solutions, we absolutely can do it. I was very careful in put it, formulating the, my climate plan for this next parliament. The five steps to net zero, which are to deliver a 60% emissions reduction by 2030. And very clear in researching, and Harry here, my uh, advisor, when it comes to that climate policy, and Luke, both have worked incredibly hard in getting that advice from experts to make sure this is an achievable plan. This is a plan achievable on our current uh, technology, current know-how. And so it's incredibly important that we don't get caught in the negative language that the major parties will try and uh, do over the next uh, few weeks as we lead into this election. This is the most vital election for global warming. We know in this, if we do not act in this next decade, it will be incredibly hard. We will reach tipping points that we won't be able to reverse. And the frustrating part is there's so much to gain. Right? It's not just about averting global warming. It is about embracing economic opportunity. There are trillions of dollars for up for investment in this transition. 70% of our trading partners are committed to net zero and are accelerating their transition. They are using their COVID recovery packages to transition to net zero and clean technologies. Sadly, Australia is not. There is still a refusal, a delay, a handbrake. It's something that can be changed and it needs to be changed. It's something the Business Council is calling for, industry groups, everyone, state governments, but there is still an inability at federal government on the coalition side to acknowledge this. I've met with many members of the coalition to discuss the climate change bill. And whilst there is an acknowledgement from most behind the scenes of the need to act on climate, there is a par that they are paralysed within the party room from doing anything. And that's why I think it is so important uh, for Waring to, to remain independent, and, from, uh, and that's why I'm so committed to remaining uh, the representative, representing your voice and your concerns. Yeah. 
So I think that's my, my wrap up of the last three years, incredibly busy. I'm incredibly thankful for the support and the input I've received from the community. Um, my focus has always been to pull back the curtain on Canberra to ensure you participate in every way possible. It is so important from uh, participating by making submissions, by being involved in inquiries, by letting you know what legislation is to be debated, getting feedback on legislation, um, but also taking a bit of worrying to Canberra and pointing out to government and to the major parties that we can do politics differently. We can do politics and representative democracy by having the community involved. So I hope um, that you have felt involved and thank you for attending tonight. This is part of it. I need to hear from the community. So I look forward to your questions, but thank you so much for coming tonight. Thank you, Zali. Um, I have to admit, I learn something new every time I hear Zali speak, and I hear her speak a lot. Uh, but yeah, I always um, admire facts and figures that she's able to retain. But um, I know that the team, what Zali was saying at the end there about taking Warringah to Canberra and bringing Canberra back to Warringah, um, we certainly take our guidance from that, and it's something we constantly think about how we can best do that. So we're going to move into questions and answers. Well, hopefully some answers. I'm sure there'll be some answers. So just a reminder for those of you that are joining us on Facebook this evening, um, don't hold back. Please feel free to, to contribute your questions as well. Um, and for those of you in the room, um, Nicola, one of our staff members, will be coming around with a microphone. So if you do have a question, just to, to raise your hand, we would uh, like you just to introduce yourself, your name and perhaps the suburb that you've come from, or if you're part of an organisation here tonight, please uh, let us know. Um, and we've, one of the highlights of these community forums is that they've always remained respectful and uh, we've always given everyone time to speak and time to listen and uh, you know not talking over the top of other people or or um, shouting people down so we would uh, appreciate for that to continue tonight um, it's always been a, a really lovely forum can't say the same thing for parliament mind you um, but uh, it's always been a highlight of these forums so with that in mind um, we might move into the question session so is there anyone in the room that would like to start with a question yes ma'am oh, Nicola do you have the microphone yep um first of all um have I got yes yes oh sorry um first of all thank you Zali for all the work you're doing um my, na oh, my, name, is my name is Victoria Adams and I live in Seaforth um I, I understand that and, and appreciate that you're doing a lot in regards to integrity and I understand that there's so much that you can put out there. One of the things I've been following and a, and a, a genuine growing concern is about what I feel is a almost a sense of a rise of autocracy and I sort of look back at the Trump and I'm very fearful. One of the things I have been following and it's not been getting much air and I think it's so serious and so undermining of democracy is this issue with the... Um, the, um, the the national cabinet and the FOR laws, the one that uh, Rex Patrick is taking up. And my understanding, I was listening to a lecture on the Integrity Commission and um, by um, Patrick Wheelie, and, and my understanding is that this is the first time under Australian constitution where an individual has placed themselves over the law and that Rex Patrick is taking this matter up again. And just combined with, I've been reading a lot of the press I mean, I know that Rudd and Murdoch have been bringing up the Murdoch press, but I'm quite shocked at the coverage of the election to date, at the bias of it. And I understand the ABC has been cut by 750 million. And it's just a, a, a growing fear. And I'd like to see this issue of the FOR laws and the National Cabinet have a little bit more airtime, because I think that the general public is quite unaware of, of the, the threat to democracy here. Thank you very much. Yeah, th uh, thank you. That it, it is really important, especially when we think of the last two years with the impact of COVID and the rules on our lifestyle, on our way of life. Uh, it was quite shocking to me to think that Australians were, A, restricted from leaving the country, but restrained from coming back to their own country as well. And these, that was challenged legally. Um, and to find that we don't actually have a right, a legal right to return to Australia was quite shocking to me, I must say. Um, some of the things that were instituted by the government 
to respond to COVID were, I think, cont well, a diff a, um, uh, uh, had an autocratic aspect to it. There was no consultation. It was not put to a vote in Parliament, for example, to shut down the border. Uh, that was something that was done. Um, it was uh, the establishment of the National Cabinet to replace COAG, when COAG was subject to rules and, and had been passed through legislation. National Cabinet was just formed, uh, is not subject to um, freedom of information requests, and does there is no uh, real clarity of report essentially. Um, so I find that concerning, I agree, uh, because I think the, uh, the hallmark of democracy is actually accountability, is transparency. We should be able to access the reasons for decisions. And I, th I think we really saw that as a breakdown as well when I, you know, I jokingly say we became a number of different countries. Uh, but it, it's quite sad to see that because we had uh, advice from health officers and medical officers that varied from state to state, yet we didn't have access to the information behind it. So there was no way of ever assessing whether the political decision was based on the same or different evidence. Was there a different interpretation occurring? And, that, and that's why I strongly believe we need a National Centre for Disease Control. We have no actual National Centre for Disease Control to establish a proper plan. In terms of autocratic, a slide towards autocracy, I am concerned by that. There's been a number of legislation and, and decisions by the government that are reducing trans, um, accountability. So there is this opposition to a Federal Integrity Commission with proper powers. Uh, in, importantly, the government opposes there being any kind of public accountability. So a minister could be found guilty, but they wouldn't, the public simply wouldn't know about it under the government model. Um, and that there is no whistleblower provision. So the only way an investigation could ever occur is by the minister requesting it to occur in the first place, which is incredibly impossible. You know, you have to be a bit cynical when you really think about who needs to be investigated. You only have to look at the full, well, what's happening in Ukraine at the moment with Russia to know the, the, the incredibly dangerous power of disinformation, misinformation, of propaganda. And that is a slide. When you lose an independent media, you do fall into propaganda. Um, and that's why I'm incredibly committed to maintain proper funding of our independent broadcasters, but also to make sure that the board is properly independent and their operations are properly independent to ensure impartiality. Uh, I have an issue just in this election, for example, the vote compass of the ABC. Uh, I'm in the process of, in fact, raising a complaint. It fails to provide for independence as an option, especially in a seat that is currently independent, if you fill out the vote compass. It is, has an assumption that it must be a political party in terms of your comparison. Now, that is an inbuilt bias that is not consistent with the charter of the ABC and an independent media. So that's something I'll be raising. But it is incredibly important and it's actually, I know a lot has happened since 2019, but it was only a few days after the election in 2019 that we saw journalists being raided uh, by the AFP and cases instituted, now instigated against those journalists. And that was an incredible breach, I think, an overreach from government into the press. Uh, and a very concerning one. And so we look at events overseas and we think that is far away and these, this, that kind of influence can't happen here. But if we don't stand up for a free press, for an independent press, if we don't question where information is coming from, that is a very real risk. Uh, and at a, at, in an era where information is so readily available, we have social media and we don't currently have laws that have really kept uh, kept pace with the, the speed of information and how this happens. We still don't have laws around deep fakes. Now, deep fakes is when someone can go and cut and paste uh, uh, audio recordings or visual recordings of a person, chop it all together to make a whole new message and then pass it off as being them having said it in the first place. This is something I was seeking to catch with Stop the Laws, uh, stop, stop the Lies Bill, to stop lying in political, political advertising because it's something we saw during the, the, tr the last presidential election in the US where deep fakes occur, where there is that kind of level of uh, interference in our election process. So, to make sure that doesn't happen, a free media, incredibly important, accountability. I have discussed with Rex Patrick the freedom of information aspect and the private member's bill um, that he has uh, put forward. He has been successful in the courts 
in actually winning against the government around that the government and the cabinet need to provide copies of the, in, of the documents he has sought under freedom of information. The ruling by the court was that no, it is not caught by confidentiality of uh, the PMO, so the Prime Minister's office essentially, um, but the Prime Minister is resisting uh, and that is in direct contempt of the court orders. And that is concerning. I would have to say my observation of the Prime Minister is not someone who is looking for scrutiny. He is not someone who uh, welcomes accountability uh, oh. and not someone who, um, you know, I, I, I have concerns about his willingness to be transparent and accountable to the Australian public in relation to a number of issues. So oh, no. I, think, I think your fears are well founded, but the one way you combat that is all of you. You have to raise your issues, you have to raise your voice. I think communities like Warringah that are engaged with democracy, you are engaged with your vote, with the issues, you hold me to account as your representative. We need to see more communities doing that all over Australia. Albanese has tested positive for COVID. So uh, oh. make for an interesting election. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Jonathan Morse from Freshwater. Uh, first of all, I'd like to sincerely appreciate the work you've done around integrity, environment uh, and inclusion. Uh, I was very grateful for your press release you put out in regards to your uh, to Ms Deves and her comments, even though they weren't, they've been taken down, but then we're standing by them, so I'm not sure whether we're meant to agree with them or not, but sincerely appreciate what you did on that. There is a very high likelihood that we're probably going to end up with a hung parliament and very keen to get your perspective on what you and your team, uh, I would assume, already starting to think about, have conversations about uh, in reference to when um, people start knocking on your door and asking where your loyalties are going to lie and how truly independent you will remain. A very important question. It's a question on a lot of people's mind. Um, incredibly important for me to remain independent. If I wanted to be a member of a party, I would be a member of a party. And I think it's really clear for the community that we're looking to do this differently. But I acknowledge, as a member of the crossbench, we need to work with um, government and opposition. And I feel like I have done that for the last three years really well, in that I've been able to work with both sides on everything. So in the event of no party having a majority, um, I would seek to to uh, discuss and meet with leaders of both sides and uh, uh, to uh, and put forward the issues that Warringah would be wanting me to. Um, I view uh, the climate change bill, the Federal Integrity Commission, as being absolute essentials moving forward for good governance and, and, and really representing Warringah. So for me it is clear that my number one focus is, is to be true to the policy issues for which I feel I would be re-elected on, and that is the primary focus. It is for me important to look at stability of government. So obviously the outcome of the election is important. So looking at how voters have responded to the proposals and who is in a better position to form a stable government. But what I've also said, and I stand by, I will not do any deal. I do not agree with secret deals. Um, I believe for good democracy we need transparency. And so I will be, uh, whilst there will be confidence to, uh, to a side to form government, there will not be a blanket supply deal. So I simply won't support blanket funding uh, to be watered the way we've seen over the last three years or from further funding of fossil fuels. So for me, that's incredibly important. And I understand other members of the crossbench feel the same way, that it is not a question of just uh, losing your independence by providing a supply, a blanket supply. And, and that way, we force better government. I know a lot of people uh, have been, I think, conditioned to think that there is only one way of doing this, that you can only have blue team, red team. Um, but in every other facet of our lives, we embrace competition, we embrace choice, because it's with choice that you raise the standards, so you actually get better outcomes for the community as a whole. And I firmly believe that it is actually with uh, more a more collaborative approach to government that we will get better outcomes. It's incredibly important to remember, we currently have a lot of secret deals in how government operates. So the coalition is a private deal between the Liberals and the Nationals. 
And I would have to say my dealings with the nationals are concerning. So when I've met with, uh, with their various leaders to discuss issues that matter to Warringah, um, there is no uh, transparency, there is no uh, real uh, engagement with those issues. And so I would want to know what the terms of the deals are in order to form government. Um, and the same way is it, it is really important for me to ensure we have fiscal discipline in terms of where, where, uh, who are for forming government as well. So I want to make sure in this next period, we absolutely need to rein in debt. We need to ensure spending is done on merit, that it is done where for benefit, for public good. Um, and for that, I think there are some key measures that need to be put in place. So I don't have a crystal ball to tell you with absolute certainty, but I have very much as my primary focus representing Warringah, representing your concerns and the issues and getting outcomes on those issues. Yeah, good day, Zali. Um, Brian Concannon from Manly. Um, I represented you, uh, helped you out for your first election when you beat Tony Abbott. Great job. That was a great campaign. Absolutely fantastic. Um, been following you um, a bit. Um, yeah, uh, your voting record, uh, legislation issues. Um, I've noticed you voted no every time except once. One yes, is that right? That's quite great, but... Oh, sorry, I'll, I'll, okay, well, okay. I commend you if that's the case, or yeah, if, if you're, like, you're not, not a government lucky, that's great. I would say my... Uh, well, if for anyone... I mean, I believe in transparency, so I know that I probably won't satisfy or please everyone on every vote, but I think it's really important for everyone to understand how or why I have voted. So my process is clear on the website um, uh, in terms of how I vote, and then the breakdown of votes. I don't know how many realise two third, uh, nearly, it is, my, my maths are missing me tonight, um, but at, twice as many votes in Parliament have been to gag debate over actual debate on legislation, which is quite extraordinary when you think about it. That means it's the games happening between uh, the opposition and government. It is when the government is shutting down debate, so amendments trying to be moved on legislation or raising issues of substance, where the government uses numbers to shut down debate. Now, this is the House of Representatives, this is the House of Debate. So my voting record is there. On substantive legislation, it is about 51% with government um, in terms of legislation. You should know about 80% of legislation passes through on the voices, which means with the support of pretty much the whole parliament because it is sensible legislation. So we're really, when you talk about uh, voting uh, records or where you're at, I have overwhelmingly um, voted with government on economic management. I have voted against government on environmental protection and integrity, I think is a probably fair summation. <laughs> Can I ask, uh, ask um, my, my real reason of concern to be here tonight is because um, of the uh, vaccines and the lockdowns and the way the government acted, which I believe was totally out of order, considering um, they, they didn't have enough evidence it was um, a death-defying pandemic. But recent evidence has just come out. Um, Pfizer's had to release um, evidence. They tried to get 75 years, but um, a judge ordered eight months. Uh, every month they got to release a new tranche of information. Uh, the first tranche said something about um, the Pfizer vaccine possibly causes 1,291 serious adverse reactions. That's right, because I, that, that is misinformation. So I, I just, no, I, no, have, no, 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 it, I have to stop Pfizer you there. actually released that, uh, Zali. But well, my, my only question is, uh, are you prepared to actually look into this, to, to look into uh, the Pfizer release of information and if you believe that um, it's, um, the vaccines are doing more harm than good, which I thoroughly do, all my research, w would you actually be against them? Or is it political suicide to uh, go against Big Pharma Pfizer? No, that look, so the case. I have Craig met... Craig Kelly, and, you know, they're my heroes. And, uh, it's political suicide. You'd, you'd be polit committing com political suicide to um, tell the truth about vaccines, wouldn't you? Well, I would have to disagree with you there. Respectfully, you're entitled to your view. But uh, for me, the premise is to be based on expert advice and actually seek the information. Oh, and most of... Blood on her hands. 
Said if you don't want to be respectful, I'll have to ask I'm you to sorry, leave. Yeah. Okay. So you're I'm entitled to your view, but the reality will be um, if I've met with a number of experts and the evidence was incontrovertible in terms oh, of on. the risk, right. and you only have the to know. Out there, I will have to ask you to leave. I'm really sorry. Okay. Um, it is incredibly important. Families have suffered incredible heartbreak. It has been an incredibly challenging few years. I've been so proud of the Warringa community and the broader community for how um, engaged and willing to uh, compromise our own personal liberty for the sake of others. So many of the measures around COVID have been about keeping your loved ones safe, what you can do for others. And it has meant we have had an incredible result from a health perspective compared to other nations. And that has to be acknowledged and that is something to be proud of. I acknowledge it has come at a huge price. And if anyone has had the opportunity to view the modern healthcare forum I had, where we discussed very much the successes of our response, but also the challenges. And there were difficulties with how uh, restrictions were imposed, the fact that there wasn't enough flexibility, the fact that some of the rules were very uh, uh, partial for certain aspects, for example, business prioritised <laughs> over family. And this was incredibly distressing. And businesses locally paid an incredible price for lockdowns and lost periods of trading. To give you an idea, our local businesses like in Manly where tourism, uh, retail and tourism is, is such an important part, 60% um, of yearly revenue is done during the three weeks of the summer trading and there were two Christmases in a row with lockdowns or pseudo lockdowns. Sorry. So you have to appreciate the importance of what we can all do as a community to contribute to make sure that we actually ensure businesses can operate but remain safe. I also met with so many frontline health professionals that absolutely, and many of you probably have those in your families, worked incredibly hard, incredibly long hours to ensure that our families and our communities could be healthy and safe. I think through COVID we also appreciated how lucky we are here on the beaches with our environment, with the space and the facilities we have. Um, and I think it really brought a whole new uh, appreciation for what a strong community we are in helping one another. I had so many programs come and talk to me about thank you projects and handing things over to, um, you know, to thank frontline workers, especially uh, cleaners and supermarket staff and bus drivers and teachers and nurses and doctors. Um, it really, really highlighted that our health as a society is ultimately the backbone of a society. If we don't ha take care of our health, if we don't take care of the vulnerable in our society, it all does come to a standstill. So I will respectfully disagree with your views. I think we have come through, but we have to also learn from it. I do support that, for Just example... Just the data, Zali. That's all no, I say. The data is, say your data is come not on. accepted. Come on. Come on. No, no, no. Stop. Stop. Well, so I do support a Royal Commission into our medical, our health response to COVID because I think it's incredibly important that we learn from it. And we haven't through it yet. We still have um, very variants coming through. And we need to make sure our systems are resilient and equipped to cope. We have pushed so many of the frontline health workers to the absolute limit. We need to make sure that we have a more resilient, sustainable system to be able to ensure with these kind of uh, uh, spikes in, in, in demand and need. Because unfortunately, pandemics and health issues also come with global warming, um, and we are already warned and on notice of increased demand and needs when it comes to that. So I think it's important that we acknowledge what was done well, what may not be done well, may maybe wasn't and how we can do it better and that's why I very much support a review uh, to make sure that we we learn and we improve the system. The government stuffed up on COVID. And that's just actually a good reminder, um, Zali's policy on modern healthcare, uh, there is a, a copy of it available this evening, it's also available online, but she has uh, policies on the new economy, uh, five steps to zero that she mentioned on climate change, 
this is going to test me now. Local environment is another policy pillar. Um, equality and inclusion is a policy document. Um, and then finally, um, integrity as well. So please feel free to visit the website um, or direct your, your friends and your neighbours and your networks to visit those policy documents if you'd like to find out a bit more detail about where Zali stands. But the modern healthcare one was about looking forward and, and how do we learn from the last two years in particular. So I encourage you all to, to take a look. Um, so just a reminder to friends on Facebook this evening, um, if you've got any questions, uh, please feel free to put them in. We've probably got about five or ten minutes, so maybe time for one or two more questions. We do want to allow some time at the end um, for you to come and speak to the staff members that are here in the room or to have a chat to Zali. Um, as we said at the beginning, it's about being available to the community and being accessible, so um, that's what this evening is all about. But um, is there anyone in the room that oh, has a question? Yes, thank you, sir. My name is Ulrich Jensen. I live in Lambie Heights. I'm one of the 50,000 plus people that couldn't come back to Australia. And I wrote to Sally's uh, team and felt that they cared about it. So that's why I'm here today. I, I'm really uh, happy for that. Now, I don't have a lot of understanding of politics because I don't trust any of you. Um, now, but it's refreshing to sit here and listen and say, you want to clear the window into Canberra. That's really what the population needs. That's the thing that what's going on down there, we have no idea. But I have a question because for me, we are 25, 26 million people. We have three layers of government. Do we really need the states? because that's a lot of um, economy lost there. So I would like to hear your op opinion about that. Look, there is some overlap. It would be incredibly difficult to change the system. I think it was quite shocking during the pandemic just how much was delegated to state governments from the federal government. And I disagreed with that, especially when it came to borders, quarantine and policy. I think that was symptomatic of our current Prime Minister more than how the system is actually set up. Um, I think the, from the, the federal government should take more leadership over the whole country and, and setting the tone um, and, and a more sustained policy. And that's why I strongly support things like a national uh, a centre for disease control. Um, when we look at how we deal with national security, when we look at broader national issues. Um, there is overlap, but there's also opportunity for accountability. I would have to say from a climate change point of view, our state governments are doing a lot better than our federal government. So I am thankful for the system at, as it stands in that because whilst we've had dysfunctional federal policy, state governments have gotten on with the job. They are focused with that delivery of service here on the ground, right? So that building of infrastructure. Um, and it is important uh, that, the, that there be a good working relationship between federal and state governments. I feel like it has broken down over this last term of parliament and that has led to dysfunctions. Um, we're seeing interference, for example, in certain aspects like um, Minister Tav and the government's interference in the energy market, for example, in the Hunter Valley for purely political purposes, but it is interfering with the state planning when it comes to renewable energy zones and other aspects. King so I, th I, th I think there are issues that uh, there is overlap. I think we, sh we need to review and make sure we streamline processes. So, for example, the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Act, one of the recommendations was streamlining approval process between, at the moment there is a duel between state and national, to streamline it to one. Now, in theory, that is a good thing to make it simpler. But that doesn't work if then you have weaker environmental protections from state to state and we then don't have a national standard. So one of the major aspects of the recommendation was a national standard, environmental protection standard. And that's something the government refused because they really wanted to weaken protections. So yes, I agree, there are overlaps and there are there is waste in that respect. But it also creates, I think, a checks and balances. It provides a different focus of state governments are essentially focused on delivering the services. Um, federal government is more focused on obviously our national policy and international relations with a 
uh, I would say certainly unstable geopolitical environment and certain challenges developing, um, that clearly has to be the focus of the federal government. Um, again, just as maybe relations with our state governments have not been as good as they should be over this last parliament, so has our, I think, our international relations suffered. suffered. Uh, we haven't seen a good uh, development of trust with other world leaders. Uh, I think our relationships with the EU is incredibly damaged by events between the Prime Minister and Emmanuel Macron. Um, yes, we have our... Uh, you know, we, our partnership with the US and UK is incredibly important, but we are part of a global world. We need to ensure we have good relations with all countries. So I do still see a strong purpose for the federal government and for how it works. Um, because of how I see the federal government working, I don't know that I would... Um, I, I do have my faith in our state in our state governments and in our federated system, um, but there is scope for improvement and for streamlining, and I certainly support that to occur where it's possible. Great. Uh, my name's David Lowe. I'm from Manly. Uh, just a question about foreign policy. I suppose this stems from the current Solomon... Islands and China issue. Are you able to give us a little bit of an insight as to how much uh, influence sensible independents like yourself and Andrew Wilkie have in the discussion in Parliament about these issues? Well, I think if it is a minority government, much greater influence, which can be also a good thing because it can be a, a more um, a moderating um, influence. What I'm concerned about is we know we've had some geopol geopolitical conflict and instability developing over the last few years. But instead of, I would say, moderated and collaborative approach or ways to maintain communication, ways to maintain um, uh, better relations, I think it has been exacerbated with inflammatory dialogue and language. Uh, it has been politicised in the, in the context of this election, which I think is incredibly dangerous, um, that our national security really should not be a political party football for the sake of the next election. That is our long-term safety at stake that really shouldn't be used in that way. And so that's where I do have um, grave concerns around um, the way that has been done, that politicisation. We need to do better at uh, engaging with our neighbours. If I look at the Solomon Islands, we've uh, been aware of uh, their concerns. Um, we have reduced aid to our Pacific neighbours. We have put strings attached to it. We have not heard their call when it's come to global warming and the threat they, they the, the existential threat that threat they have. And so that they are now turning to other other powers for support rather than us as their neighbours is concerning and that is a, a, a policy failure. Um, and I think we need to do better at engaging uh, with uh, with the international community and, and that is something I criticise the current government for in that its, its um, divisive approach has extended to foreign, affair, for foreign relations and I think that's dangerous. Oh, no. Shooing the fly, maybe. Were there any more? Uh, yeah. Okay. Last question there. Hi, Anita Gleeson from Curl Curl. Um, looking at the other independents who are running in this election, um, should we be lucky enough to get some more like-minded uh, independents representing different areas? Have you considered how you might work with them? collaboratively and have you had conversations with them? Look, I have met a number of them. I've done the odd talks and events. I was today at a fuel security event, in fact, where Carly Tink and Allegra Spender were also speaking at. Um, I very much welcome the more independence running. And in fact, Warringah inspired many, many other seats to regain their democracy, their vote, make your vote count. If I could share with you the experience of being in parliament and attending the chamber for a, for a division and seeing my colleagues from major parties basically pull out their pager and they have a pager that tells them where they need to go and what they need to vote on. And they have no knowledge at the most of the time of what the legislation is that they're voting on. Time and time again, they've 
you know, they, they, they come in and they just follow, it's like sheep, they follow one side to the other of where they need to vote. They don't listen to the debate, they don't listen to amendments, they don't listen to concerns. They have so little input that I just don't see how that is democracy at work. It is just not representing communities. What you have is a very small group of people within the Prime Minister's office a kitchen cabinet style decision making process that decides legislation and where it's going. I've in fact had conversations with members, uh, backbenchers, asking me, you know, what's the government's position on this? And I'm surprised when they are in the same party room. Um, so it really just shows the lack of truly democratic debate that is occurring. There's too much decision making that is not occurring for public for public benefit. So I welcome more independents running at this election and I really, really hope they are successful. Um, I know they are running on strong platforms of climate change and integrity and, and a new style of politics. You have to appreciate we have had this old system of two-party politics of, um, you know, the status quo. They do not want to break the status quo. They are comfortable with the status quo because it has provided them power and access to power and access to the public purse for so long. The media is incredibly comfortable with that system as well because it's what they know. They do not like change and don't like disruption. But we know we can create this a more competitive parliament, a more, uh, a more, by being more competitive and more accountable, you will get better outcomes. We see that state governments are um, very often minority governments. So many European countries have minority governments. It is how you get much better outcomes. So I have great hope, and if you have members of your family or network that live in other electorates, I encourage them to really look at who you are voting for on the big issues that we face. And we have a huge amount of challenges, but a huge amount of opportunities for this next decade. What we do now matters. It is so vital. In this election, 2022, will determine what policies are put in place. The next election, 2025, is too late. We will not be able to change the course of so many of the things that get set up. And unless we do significant emissions reduction by 2030, we're, we're well on our way past two degrees of warming with huge consequences that that, that will bring about. So there is incredible, it's incredibly important for people to be mindful of their vote, engage with your vote, engage with that process, make it count. This is a right that people fight for, that our, our forebears have fought for to, to protect democracy. Don't take it for granted, celebrate it, respect it, appreciate it, by, by really engaging with the election. And I know the media positions the current election in a very presidential style, that it's the choice between two leaders. But at the end of the day, the only people voting for those two members are the people of Cook and the people of Grangler, right? It, it, then it's the party room that, that elects them. But it is each community needs to look at the MP that will represent them and their issues. And I think that is what is the core of the values of the independent movement. Yeah. Probably a, a highlight to, to finish on. Um, just a, a bit of a promotion. Our next community town hall meeting is happening in a few weeks on the 1st of May. So um, if you wanted to, to spread the word to tell others, um, for those of you on Facebook, if you'd like to join us in person in the room, 1st of May is our, our next forum. We'd love to see you there. Um, so uh, the details for that are on the website. As I mentioned before, Zali's policy documents, her voting record, um, details about grants programs. There is a wealth of information uh, up on the website. Um, if you get people asking, but what has she ever done for us? There is a page that says achievements. And um, you know, Zali and, and we as a team are really proud of those achievements. So it's a long list, I have to say. So um, I encourage you to get on it and have a look at that. But um, the website does provide a wealth of information. You can sign up for Zali's newsletter there. So we uh, have an electronic newsletter that goes out every two weeks to keep people updated with what's happening in Moringa and also um, what legislation is being passed down in Canberra. As Zali said, um, pulling back the curtain on, on Canberra
member is a really important motivator for all of us. So I encourage you to take a look at the website. Um, if you have people in your life that are between 18 and 24, I think the age bracket is, um, there's a group called Gen Zali on social media and I encourage you to encourage them to take a look at Gen Zali and uh, some of the events that they're planning. There's one happening in Brookvale um, next Tuesday evening. I think it is. Someone will correct me if I'm wrong on that. But um, I'm not between 18 and 24, so I'm, I'm not part of Gen Zali. But yeah, no, I encourage you to have a look. And one final thing that Zali did touch on, um, the Stop the Lies legislation that she's introduced in Parliament about truth in political advertising. We're going to see over the next three or four weeks just how important that need is for that. If you get something in your letterbox or if you drive past a banner that you just don't think is right, um, we've actually set up an email address where you can report that to. Um, unfortunately, the government won't do it, AEC won't do it. Um, so we've set up a, a mechanism where you can let us know if you see something dodgy because chances are, if it looks dodgy, it probably is dodgy. And some of you might be aware from the recent council campaign, um, some of the dirty tricks that, that went on there. So um, the email address, and I'm gonna make sure I get it right, is report misinfo at zalistegel.com.au. And again, the details and the background for that email address are on um, Zali's website. So, yeah, so, so, so what happens with those emails um, is that they'll get assessed and the ABC are actually running um, a research project themselves collecting data and examples of misinformation, disinformation um, and other material that's out there. So again, thanks to our national broadcaster that, uh, yeah, um, the national broadcaster is uh, keeping an eye on things for us. So um, that avenue is there. Um, finally, we will wrap up, but um, there are staff members in the room this evening, and if you perhaps have a, an issue or a concern that you didn't want to raise publicly, by all means, come and have a chat to us. So um, I'm the only one not wearing a name tag, but my name's Bronwyn. Feel free to come and have a chat to me. Um, but we also have staff around. We've got um, Luke in the back corner in the blue shirt and Harry at the front, who are Zali's policy advisors. Um, then we've got Nicola at the back, who runs the business operations for our electorate office. We've got Julie Giannassini, um, who I know you mentioned with your immigration cases, she can assist with citizenship, immigration. Um, and then we've also got Diana and Matt from the electorate office who are here to help as well. And Rachel, our grants officer. Um, she's the one you might all make a beeline for. She's got the money, so go and see her. Actually, we're in caretaker mode, so she can't help you at the moment. But um, no, once the grants program starts up, in all seriousness, if you're part of a, a group or an organisation and you'd like to know more about grants opportunities, please have a chat to Rachel. Um, but I also just want to thank as well Cathy Stretch, who's in the audience, who's been helping us um, organise tonight's forums and some other events. So thank you, Cathy. And uh, Hadley, who's a staff member who, um, given school holidays, we're a family-friendly workplace and uh, she can't be here tonight, but she helped organise. And uh, finally, a shout out to Sean, who's on Facebook. Um, he's home with COVID, uh, but he's our staff member who's been monitoring Facebook. And I know some of you turned up tonight just to meet Sean because he's helped you so much. Um, um, so I'm sure we can arrange that in the future. But yeah, please feel free. Don't feel you need to rush off. Um, come and have a chat. Uh, but otherwise, feel free to spread the word, um, sign up for the newsletter, and uh, let's get Zali back in Canberra. Okay, thank you.